Welcome to Wine Soundtrack Australia. Listen to the passion with which producers narrate their winery and their world. In 30 Answers, discover their stories, personalities and passions. Hello, friends and listeners of Wine Soundtrack. I am here with Keith Hentke from Hengli Farm Wines. How are you, Keith? I am fabulous, Priscilla. <laughs> Guys, here's my boss. I'm going to interview my boss. Oh, my God. I'm in trouble today, Keith. Um, no, you're not in trouble yet. You might be at the end. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so, Keith, can you tell where are you located? Uh, we're in the Barossa Valley, the mighty Barossa Valley in South Australia. So, uh, we are at um, this, what is the, the difference about the Barossa Valley wines and the Barossa Valley regions about Australia? What do we? What is the secret about Barossa Valley wines? Uh, well, this might be a long part of the story. Well, we started, uh, well, the Barossa Valley was started as a wine region back about 170 years ago. So, it's a really, really old region. We're founded by German settlers. In fact, um, I'm a Henschke in part of my family back in 1842. We're, we're some of the first 26 families to the Barossa Valley. So a long time. So I've been here a long time. Um, the other thing is to note is the soils here and the climate are absolutely ideal for making wonderful, rich, intense, well-balanced wines, and particularly reds and particularly Shiraz. <laughs> That's why you have a lot of Shiraz here, right? That is absolutely why we have a lot of Shiraz. <laughs> <laughs> so, Keith, tell us, how many hectares um, of the land do you have here? Uh, we have 40 hectares ourselves, and then we also use another uh, grapes from 10 hectares from our winemaker. So 50 all up, part of the estate. Cool. So what type of a wine do you make it? Well, as I said, we planted mostly Shiraz, uh, but we've got Cabernet Sauvignon, Grenache, a little bit of Zinfandel, and a tiny amount of Viognier. And they're all from the estate. We also make some wines that aren't from the estate, and so we make a white sparkling wine, we make some Riesling, um, and a few other bits and pieces, but we really focus on what comes from the estate. Cool. So tell about the Zinfandel. How does Zinfandel can grow here in Barossa? Tell us. It's not hard, that hard to grow, but to grow it well is a little bit harder. Now, it started when I first came here, or I planted the vineyard down. When I came here, there were some old vines, but the cows were eating them, and I reckon you'd work out, Priscilla. <laughs> it didn't work very well. So I had to uh, replant again. And so uh, I thought, back in, this, back in 1999, I thought there was a reasonable chance that by about 2010, the world had, would have fallen out of love of Shiraz from the Brossa. I'm pretty pleased. I was very wrong in that regard. But anyway, I was looking for a turn of variety and I tried some Zinfandels. I tried some from uh, California. I'd had some from WA. And I thought, wow, you know, I'd like the Californian Zins. Um, and I think thought they could go really well here. Uh, and we probably don't need to get them as big in alcohol to get the flavours here, given our climate and so forth. So, but so, so to get flavour at low alcohol, I chose a part of the property that a vineyard consultant said, Keith, do not plant this with anything. <laughs> And, and as a woman, and she said, uh, and definitely do not plant it with Zinfandel because you're going to be pulling that out. <laughs> well, we can tell her now that uh, we're now 20, 22 years after that and they're still there and still growing. And absolutely people love it as if they're right? Oh, absolutely. And uh, and I think particularly those people who have had the Californian style, the really big, rich, intense style, uh, they really enjoy ours because that's the, the more of the style we make now. We've had, we have changed the style around a bit. But sometimes we've been a bit like, like, lighter and a bit more elegant, but now we're back to making bigger ones and people love it. <laughs> Great. So tell us, uh, how much do you sell your wines here in Australia? How much do you sell in overseas? Ah, oh, well, well, it's changed slightly. We're, we've always been about 80% in Australia. That's been our typical, but it's gone up and down a bit. We're, we, we were quite um, uh, strong in the US before the, the GFC, the global financial crisis, and the our dollar went up too much and that slowed that up. We were starting to make some good inroads into China. Well, that's gone to zero. So, but pretty well we're back. So now it's not, you know, we're more than 80% in Australia. We're actually probably 90 something percent, which is fine. It's great. It's a great market here. Sounds good. So, where about the people can find your wine overseas? Ah, well. 
places like they can find them in the United Kingdom. They can go to Harrods. They're in Harrods. And, uh, uh, but we sell wine in the United States, uh, Canada, um, Singapore. They're still in China now, but we just can't ship anymore. <laughs> um, Korea, Taiwan. Um, you'll find them in Germany. Uh, you'll find them in Holland and probably further places that I've just overlooked. <laughs> so let us know about Keith Henschke. We want to know about you, Keith. Tell us how that passion about wine start. Yeah, and in fact, I should just clarify. See, I'm a Henschke. So many of the listeners may know about Henschke wines. And uh, we came out together on the same boat back in 1841. So um, we're from the same place. We think that we're the same family about one generation before we came, uh, both came to Australia. But the fam- their name, the, the Henschke wine name, has no T in it. My, you know, my name has a T, so I'm a uh, Henschke with a T. And so my family came to the Western Barossa. And uh, after about being here for around about 50 years, they foolishly left. And they left to go farming in, in the, just north of the Barossa. And then they ended up about two hours east of the Barossa. And that's where, that was where I was born, two hours east of the Barossa, on this big, large farm. It was about you know, 10,000 hectare farm. And there was no horticulture in the area at the point at that time. And my father and my uncle had a crazy idea in the 1970s, we're talking, I'm I'm giving a bit of a hint about my age. (laughs) Um, In the 1970s, they decided to plant a vineyard on our property. Now, we were the only, had the only vineyard for more than 100 kilometres around. There was just no other vineyards and it was a small vineyard. And my dad had no idea, uh, bear in mind, this is before internet, no one could Google how to run a vineyard and he had no idea and he was making a bit of a botch of a job. He was he buggered it up. Well, I'm not sure. I should tr- you should translate all those words. He was doing a terrible job of, of this vineyard in the middle of nowhere. So at the age of 15, he said, Keith, can you please run the vineyard? I said, I've got no idea. He said, well, you can't do any worse than me. So off I go. So that was my first learning. And so, my yeah, my first sort of ownership job was to manage a vineyard. And uh, um, that got my interest. And soon after I left school, I went to study at Roseworthy Agricultural College. Now, you may be aware, Priscilla, that's quite a famous university in Australia to to learn your trade, to be a winemaker or an agricultural scientist. I chose at that time, I wasn't I didn't go down the winemaking field. I was I went down the agricultural science. I'm more of a, a grape grower kind of guy, and uh, so that's what I did. And I left there, but I, I've made wonderful friends in the wine industry. Wonderful friends. Some of my best friends are winemakers. Uh, left there and started after a couple of years. Started working with Orlando Wyndham uh, or Pernod Ricard, uh, the guys who had the Jacobs Creek brand, and they were in the Barossa Valley. And I worked there uh, worked there for a number of years. But I always wanted to have my own winery and uh, uh, not just my own winery I wanted it to be the grey grub because I was used to growing right I, I like to grow I didn't I didn't want to be the virtual winemaker which was very popular in Australia in that era where you just go and buy grapes and uh, you wouldn't own vineyards and you buy grapes and you turn them into wine and you create a brand I wanted to be the grower so I took longer and uh, than what others did. And so what what was in, important to me, I knew about terroir. I knew it was really important to get uh, the perfect terroir. And, and uh, um, I went looking for vineyards to buy it and uh, uh, couldn't necessarily find the, the one I wanted. And, and in that during that process, I asked a lot of my winemaking friends, and, uh, and they were in the Barossa, and I said, where in the Barossa uh, the, is the best place to grow the highest quality grapes to make the best yeah. red wine? Yeah. And more than one said, oh, Keith, you should look out the northwest part of the Barossa at a place called Sepulsfield. We're getting some amazing results around there. Go and have a look there. And I went, oh, okay, more than one person. I should actually do that. And uh, I tried some wines from out this way. In fact, interesting, I tried some wines from Greenock Creek. And uh, tasting them blind, I went, these are amazing. That's what I want to be. Come on, tell us how age, how old you were. Uh, you might think I was. Uh, I, I think at the point of time I'm, I was. I was in my late twenties. So I've been doing this for a while, and I'm not in my late twenties any longer. So, um, so we're going back to 1997 yeah. is when actually I purchased. Anyway, so um, I, I, I was told about 
look in these areas and they said look for beautiful look for these red brown earths so red soil over limestone over um, calcium carbonate soils they call the terra rossa soils look for those you'll get some great results and uh, I thought oh, okay let's look around the area and I thought I wonder if there's a soil map somewhere so I went to the local library in Tanunda which is a small town in the area and I was so surprised I found a soil map of the area and so I could I, I found the map that showed me these beautiful soils that were exactly what people were describing and I went mm, I want to I want to get these soils but I also want to be near the town and get water because even uh, and I want to be on the creek bank because that's where the best soils typically were um, and also free water so uh, you know I, I drove around and I found the exact property I wanted and uh, um, I went and uh, you know worked out who owned the property and went and knocked on the door and uh, um, ended up, um, you know, that's a long story in itself, yeah. Priscilla, how that happened. I'm not sure as you go down that uh, rabbit yeah. hole, but, uh, yeah, ended up uh, getting the exact property I want based on the terroir. Yeah. That was something like a secret maybe. When you drink, the, for the first time, you drink a glass of wine, how old were you? <laughs> ah, um Yeah, I reckon I'm going, look, I may have been drinking a little bit before I should have, um, but let's put it this way. So it's certainly, certainly, uh, and I don't mind beer either because I'm an Aussie, Aussie guy, uh, typically we like beer when it gets hot, yeah. but I was, when my friends were only drinking beer, I was drinking beer and wine at 18, and, oh, and right. so I was, I was doing um, wine trips, I remember one of my first uh, wine trip was getting a car with a friend and driving to the Hunter Valley, yeah. which was about uh, 14 hours drive to go to Cellador's and the Hunter, and that was when I was 18, so that gives you some insight that I've been interested in wine for a long time. <laughs> a lot of experience here. Do you believe leave in a perfect variety Keith uh, do I believe in perfect variety well it's a good question because um, with a changing environment that things are changing right so I would have said in the past the perfect variety for the Barossa Valley is clearly Shiraz right clearly Shiraz um, I now wonder whether Um, and, and certainly in some years, Shiraz, in terms of in terms of our in terms of what the quality we make is still Shiraz. We make phenomenal Shiraz here, um, but I think with a changing environment, I think the pendulum is slowly swinging to um, other varieties of very much coming up close to them, like Grenache in the Barossa. Um, is a wonderful variety and it particularly can handle the hotter summers we've been getting, except this year it's been a beautiful mild summer, yeah. um, but uh, I'm a believer in climate change, I'm a believer that the climate has changed already and that Grenache is actually able to withstand that uh, better than most that we grow, so so I'm still, I still think that Shiraz as close to, as you can get to perfect, but we've got to keep an eye on other varieties that can handle the warmer conditions. Let's talk about social media, Keith. How good are you are? Are you with social media? Now, I just wonder whether you ask this question because you know I'm absolutely <laughs> terrible. Absolutely terrible. I could use a lot of other expletives, but I'm very ordinary. Though I have, um, what's it called? That Facebook. Facebook, is it? I've been on Facebook a while, but that, that Instagram thing. In fact, I, I went for five years without posting anything. And, and the only post I've done is someone else did for me. So, yeah, I'm pretty ordinary. Do you prefer any social media, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook or LinkedIn, anything? Um, to be fair, I think most of it's a waste of time. It's not me, right? I, 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 I like to live life. I like to experience things in real time. I'm not the guy who takes photographs of anything. I just like to experience it. So I don't really understand why people spend any time on it, really. And I like to talk to people face to face. None of this, none of this talking through another media. So yeah, now nah, look, I'd be very happy if none of them, none of them existed. <laughs> do you believe? Um, so do you do you do you have a seller? Uh, yeah, in fact, um, the reason I bought my current house I'm in is because of its seller. I have a wonderful seller. How many bought it? Ah, that's a, that's a different question. Although the physical space is wonderful, it's a bit <laughs> empty. Well, because I've been in this for so long, I've amassed a lot of bottles. I did amass a lot of bottles, and I've spent the last near 10 years trying to drink as many as I can so I can then replenish. And, of course, we've got so much Henley Farm bottles, I don't know. So <laughs> I think if my cellar was full, maybe 
it could take two or three thousand, four thousand bottles. And which one is the most expensive? Australia or overseas? Ah. <laughs> ah. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't go. I haven't gone and looked at any individual. I've probably, you know, I've got, in Australian terms, I've got a, you know, I've got a fair collection of Grange Hermitage and so forth from various uh, vintages. Um, but I'm pretty sure I've got a few French wines tucked in away, which might be slightly more expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, a question. Just imagine, VIP person drinking Haley Farming wines overseas. And then some magazine, a very famous magazine, just going there, take a picture of this famous person with a Henry Farmer wines. If you imagine that VIP famous person, do you have anything, any person in particular you'd like to see drinking Henry Farmer wines overseas? Well, uh, yeah, you know, I'm a big fan of Russell Crowe. <laughs> I reckon he's a kind of guy. I reckon he'd like. I reckon Russell Crowe would like the Beast. So yeah. I reckon that would be a good mix. <laughs> good answer. Well done. Um, question for you: Each vintage, Keith, is a different story or not? Yeah, it is, and uh, and, and particularly because for us, where we focus on the one estate, the single estate here, we really. You know, we, our success or failure is is on the each vintage, and you know it's kind of fun. I love the fact that being Bromley Single State Winery, that yeah, we just we just have to deal with what we're dealt with, right? And so from, and in some t- you know, there's been some tough vintages um, from you know, too much rain, not enough water, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we managed to to pretty well handle those. In fact, I love the 2011 vintage, which was seen as a really challenging vintage in many places but uh, uh, you know I love that because because we dealt with it you know we've got gnarly soils here you know, gnarly shallow they're tough they can handle we can handle a lot of water and rainfall and still um, still our vines can be, have some level of stress to produce super quality and and but we're worried in 2011 where we um, ended up uh, harvesting um, and, and dry racking some of ours, Amarone style. And so that's what we... So we, I love the fact that you, have, you can think your way through any vintages, except for maybe this year. It's so easy, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got a new vineyard manager, and he could have been asleep. He could have been asleep. He could have been at the beach <laughs> all year, and it would not, not, not make much difference. Now, don't tell him that, but I reckon that's the case. <laughs> Kev, um, tell us about when do you want it to be? When you're little, little, little... Do you, do you have like a tell your mom do you want it to be something else is not in the wine industry? Yeah, well, I reckon back back when I was little, 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 before we put the vineyard in on this on this property, I think all I always wanted to be as a farmer, right? Really? I always wanted to be a farmer, and I am still a farmer, but just Different farming way. grapes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Whereas in the past it was farming sheep and cattle and growing cereal crops, but now it's just farming in a different way. Get it out to wine. Red, sparkling, whites, fortified. What's your favourite? Raw reds. Clearly dry, <laughs> clearly dry, clearly dryly white. I mean, I like white sparkling wine, yes, but I, you know, a glass or two. I love red sparkling Shiraz, absolutely. That's probably occasional for me rather than, you know, every day. Um, I quite like a white wine every now and then, but I, can, I drink a lot of red. I love red. I love red, always have. So, Hagley Farm has one of the most well-known restaurants in, here in Australia. So, tell us, have you had paired white wine with meat or red wine with fish? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, um, I, I'm a big fan of um, adapting the sauces in particular for the wine. So, get a fish and have some chocolatey sauce, some power, um, even a bit of liquid or something, it will match beautifully with as any red wine you can find. Um, and, you know, probably with with white wines, maybe you want something with a bit more depth and texture and away you go. No, absolutely. No, no I think those the, the old rules of you've got to have, uh, you know, a certain big red with red meat, uh, throw them out the window. <laughs> old rules is old rules, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, question for you. How many glasses or bottles of wine are needed to get you drunk? <laughs> Tell us. Uh, I think that's, uh, if you would have said, how many bottles of wine do I need to speak garbage? So, <laughs> um, 
right. I'm not sure if I need any, really. Um, but certainly, uh, certainly one bottle, I can speak a reasonable amount of garbage. Two, you're starting to find it difficult to understand what I'm saying, and uh, it won't make a lot of sense. I, my limit is uh, you don't want me around having drunk more than two and a half bottles. You do not want to listen to me after that. <laughs> What do you do in the next day for recover to the one very bad hangover? <laughs> yeah, well, this is, I have to thank my father for this. He, that, you know, farming type, he used to teach you, it doesn't matter how much you drunk, you have to, have to get up the next morning earlier than normal and go and do some physical work and just tough it out, right? So, so I'm into that, right? So I'm, I'm a big exercise guy and so it might be go ride my bike for two or three hours, go for a two hour run, do something and just work it off. And I find the first hour is very painful. <laughs> <laughs> so you talk about exercise, do you do any sport in particular? Well, for my sins, I'm, I had a bucket list is to, to do uh, an Ironman triathlon. So I'm a triathlete at the moment. Oh, wow. So I do like other sports and golf and things like that, but it's taking up a lot of time just swimming, running and riding a bike. Who is your favourite single group? Oh, can we go back to my era? Look, I'm, yes. a, I'm a major fan yeah. of the Beatles. I'm a, I could listen to the Beatles still forever. <laughs> so that's why you coming here listening this morning? Uh, not today, for some reason. I'm not sure why. You've called me out. Yeah. Uh, tell us, where did you go on your first date? Do you still remember? My first date? Gee, and now you are. <laughs> <laughs> I know my first date was my current wife. I know that one. Um, and she thought I was being a bit cheap. <laughs> I try to remember. And she was still remind me of that. <laughs> So where did you go? Oh, well, it was, a, it was a very cheap Italian restaurant. It wasn't a good Italian <laughs> restaurant, so it won't be, you know, it's, I think it's shut now. <laughs> did, you drink na- did, you, did you drink wine that night? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely drank wine that night. <laughs> was it Australian wine? Uh, yes, it was, <laughs> of course. Um, did you, did you um, have a question for you, just to complete the, the sentence? A day without wine is like? A headache. Love it. <laughs> uh, do you have any good lucky ritual or anything you usually do before the vintage start? Um, I think that I, you know, my ritual is, you might be surprised here, I stay away from the winery until vintage is in and I know that it's got good quality, which is pretty well always, but good yields as well. Because then, because what happens if the yields are bad, you won't see me at the winery, I just avoid, I just like avoid it. So my ritual is, I'm gonna, I just don't want to know bad news, right? <laughs> so I'll stay away, you just won't see me until almost next vintage, I'll hide. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about 2021 vintage. 2021 vintage, well, just it's just amazing, you know. So, so the most difficult years here on this vineyard are the dry years, the years we don't get good rainfall, the you know the season before, uh, which is sort of counterintuitive, right? Because most people think the the, the poorer vintages are the wet reason, but not here because the soils are so bony and harsh. We need good rainfall, so it was a good start. We had good winter rainfall, good spring rainfall. It's been cool, but the weather has been so. So the things you you know you got to be worried about is like you know have we had enough rain? There's correlation between good yield and, and rainfall. Good rain. Did we miss hail? Yes. At at uh, the time of set of the grapes, was it cold and windy? No, it wasn't. It was quite mild, so that was good. We got through that hurdle. There was a hailstorm come through. Like oh, you know, we're going to get hit by hail. We just got just the most smallest amount of hail damage that is unregular. So, okay, we miss hail, and so then you start moving through. And and you know Australia, we can we can have some really hot summers, but it's been mild. We've only had I think two days over 40 degrees Celsius, which is so rare for us. It's normally maybe 10 or 15. So it's been pretty mild, and you know so we get maximum flavour development around 28 to 30 degrees Celsius, and we've had. So 
so many days like that. So it's been a dream. It's been so easy. It's been perfect. And and you know those cool that we just you know, we just get those wonderful ripening conditions to get big flavours. In fact, I've just tried some wines a minute ago, and they are outstanding, outstanding. Good to hear that. So very good for 2020 vintage in Barossa. Tell us, um, what sort of wine do you believe people will be drinking in the future? Yeah, look, you know, what I hope doesn't happen, you know, there's, there's this, this movement towards all sorts of things. Now, I have to say that, you know, it's kind of fun that people experiment, do different things, and there's, I think there is an opportunity for many different styles of wine. But some of the things I hope don't get on too much, like, like when you have a look at some of these bag there's too much you know like so you go are people going to go to all these natural style winemakers where you completely let everything go by itself and go well i hope not because one of the things i think we've learned in australia is our more um our style of winemaking where we don't like uh too much um spoilage of the wine in the process we like to sort of the fruit do the talking rather than the microbes which don't want to be there i think that's important so hopefully you're going to see that the market will continue to favor substantially one of this you know the, the, the australian clean style of wine making but there'll be twists i think there'll be a lighter style of wines i think that the, the movement towards low alcohol um for um will get bigger um than what it is i think there'll still be a niche Uh, of, of you know these moderate alcohols like we have here um, that'll still be there so I think you have, I, th- I think the organic I think there'll be more um, demand for organic style wines as we go go on you know in Australia the demand is a bit small but I think it'll grow but there'll be all sorts of weird and wonderful things with wine as you see now there's you know the gins with wine and all these various things I think we're going to see more 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 beverages with just bits of wine in them, right? So I suspect that that's here to stay and that'll probably get bigger. Sounds good. So have it have you been to overseas? Uh, Priscilla, I don't know how many times I've been overseas. <laughs> um, I, I, I think I started travelling when I was 18, but I'm guessing it'd have to be a guess 50 or 60 times. I'm not sure. Good. So do you visit a lot of your wine regions? Do you have any wine regions you'd like to visit? Yeah, I love wine regions, right? And uh, uh, one of my jobs in, when I was working for Lena Wyndham, I used to import Porrigier champagne. Oh. And I, I went to visit, uh, um, in fact, Christian Porrigier. He was there, and that was fabulous. I love it. I really did enjoy that. I love going to Bordeaux. Um, I've been through various wine regions in Italy, other regions in France. I've been to Napa. I've been through various regions in Canada, I've been all through New Zealand. Um, yeah, I love travelling through wine regions, I think it's just wonderful. Do you have any wine regions you'd like to explore? Any others? Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely, and I think just a bit hard now though, I have to say, a little bit tricky, isn't it? Um, so uh, I'm just trying to think what's next going to be on my itinerary you know what i could keep going back to france and italy again first before i go elsewhere <laughs> beautiful place i have been there in 2018 amazing um so did you like your interview oh terrific i, I was i was hoping you're gonna be in a hard question but they're all pretty simple <laughs> give us a vote from one to ten uh eleven are you honest yeah of course <laughs> So it did not finish yet. I would like to suggest we play a game. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, why don't we play a game? <laughs> are you ready? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> so I tell you the song and then you have to tell me the grape. Right? Right. Yeah, we well, okay. <laughs> so the first song I'd like you to, to, to sing it for you. That's okay? Um, are you a good singer, Priscilla? I haven't heard you, I haven't heard you sing. I'm a good singer. Uh, so, come together right now over me, the Beatles. Oh, well, oh, can I go for a blend? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, GSM. <laughs> Grenache, Shiraz, Mavedra. Or maybe GS is it. Oh, yeah, that's even better again. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> so, we have the stray mongrel here, the Grenache, Shiraz and Zinfandel blend. Um, so, 
something more nice and relaxed, like no mama no cry. Okay, I am thinking Vionia. Sounds great, relaxing one. And if you're going to something more Latin, right? One, un, dos, tres. Un paso en un balón de María. Un, dos, tres. Un pasito para atrás. <laughs> I was tossing up between uh, Zinfandel and Riesling, but uh, I'm going to go Riesling. <laughs> Tell me a bit of zest. <laughs> So the next song we prefer you will be a little bit more classic. Oh, he's a working class man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. A working class man. You know, I'm going. I'm going Grenache, straight Grenache, the workhorse. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then something like a more happy, the happiness, like because I'm happy. Ah, we're going Shiraz here, absolutely. Can I just say, though, you did a really bad job with that song before, <laughs> Work Class Man. I think you have to cut that. <laughs> I should sing it better, yeah? <laughs> yeah, I think you need to practice that. <laughs> Jimmy uh, Barnes would not be happy. <laughs> so, thank you so much, Keith, for the interview today. I would like you to please just see remind all listeners how to reach your cellar door and your, your website please uh, well depending where you are well, depends where you are well when you can fly here is probably the best from international so you fly into Adelaide Adelaide's a wonderful city uh, it's well, it's the best city in Australia actually <laughs> and we're only about one hour's drive from Adelaide go head north and that's where you find the Barossa and um, interesting enough uh, some people think Henley Farm is sort of in the outskirts of Barossa Valley, but it depends which way you come. If you come from the airport, we're quite close. Um, so in the northwestern part, easy to find. Um, you need to book, though, because we get busy, and you need to book for tasting, and you need definitely need to book to get in our restaurant. So, uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you here. To see us? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I look forward to seeing you. <laughs> Please come and visit and uh, track me down. <laughs> so tell um, the website, please. Ah, www.hentleyfarm.com.au. Thank you so much, Keith, for the interview. Thank you. Have a great day and a great vintage for 2021. Thank you, Priscilla. My <laughs> pleasure. Cheers. Thanks for listening to a new episode of Wine Soundtrack Australia. For details and updates, visit our website, winesoundtrack.com. 